And so it's appropriate that you bring an accountant with a degree in higher education and certified as a secondary guidance counselor to come talk about place. Are you sure? <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. I, I was very honored by the invitation to come talk to you today and share with you a little bit about what we're doing in Oklahoma City. Um, Oklahoma City is a, a vibrant community that indeed has had its share of challenges, as most cities have. And to really talk about where we are today, we kind of have to go back in history and start at the beginning. Oklahoma City is a very unique city. Not many cities were founded the way we were, literally with the firing of a gun and a stampede. The land run of 1889, Oklahoma City went from a city of zero population to 10,000 people overnight. Being a western town, we did what comes natural. We started a government. We elected a mayor. We elected a sheriff. Three days later, the mayor ticked somebody off. They shot him. We elected a new one. He got the message, and everything kind of progressed from there. And for the next 60 or so years, Oklahoma City continued to develop much the way most cities did. You had a downtown area where your main street shopping, your retail, your entertainment, all those things were located, and you grew organically around that base. Then something happened. It's called sprawl. It's called suburbia. The result of what happened at the end of World War II when young men and women came back from fighting a war and decided that the white picket fence and the shoebox house wasn't really what they were looking for anymore. And suddenly, we saw a tremendous explosion in Oklahoma City area of people wanting to move to suburbia. A lot of cities saw that. We carried it a little bit to the extent. Oklahoma City is the third largest city in the United States geographically. 625 square miles inside the city limits of Oklahoma City. That's a big city. And what happened as a result of that was that we soon began to see our downtown area die. We soon began to see businesses close and people start moving out, taking businesses with them. Residential was not as important downtown as it once had been. And about that time, the federal government started a new program called Urban Renewal. Oklahoma City wanted to be on the forefront of that. So they did something that they thought would help and they hired a gentleman by the name of I.M. Pei. Pei is one of the most renowned architects in the world. And he came to Oklahoma City to lead us in an urban development process, redevelopment process. He came up with a plan that basically said you started out with the land run and even though it's a square city, set off in quarter, quarter shares, you really need to rethink what you've done. So the plan was very simple. We're going to tear down Oklahoma City and start from the ground up. In the 1960s, city leaders said, OK, let's do that. And they began that process. The problem with it was it was not sustainable. But in 60, nobody, was cared, nobody cared about sustainability. You know, this is a great idea. Let's, let's go. It was not sustainable because the project was greatly undercapitalized. The reliance on the federal government for ongoing funding, we all know what, what happens there from time to time, depending on who's in power and, and what Congress decides to do, what new project or new program comes along. So before long, we had a city where many of our downtown buildings had been torn down. Our residents were moving outside the city. What had once been a vibrant downtown was suddenly dying. And literally, we were killing it. We also were in a city that had tremendous internal problems. Infighting between local government, inside government, with other agencies, with the business community, with the residential community, was at an all-time high. Oklahoma City tried for years to pass referendums to do a variety of things, and nothing passed didn't matter what it was. They could not muster enough votes of the citizens to move forward to do anything. This continued through the mid-1980s, and literally by the middle of the 80s, we were dead. 
No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Eight of the ten major banks headquartered in Oklahoma City had failed. We had gone from a city that had 4,000 hotel rooms in our downtown community to one hotel with 400 rooms. In the mid-1980s, there were 3,800 bankruptcies in the Western District Court of Oklahoma. That's Oklahoma City West. And if you've been to Oklahoma, you know that there ain't much west of Oklahoma City. A lot of cows and a lot of, a lot of now wind farms. So what do you do? You know, you've got a dead city, a dying city, a dying community, a community that nothing is taking hold. We were fortunate in that we had city leadership, particularly from the private sector, that knew that something had to happen. We were facing an election, and they decided that business as usual just wasn't good enough. So some of our business leaders decided that the best thing to do was to go out and recruit a non-politician to run and see if we couldn't begin building our city back. We elected a young man by the name of Ron Norick. Now Ron happened to be a businessman who had a little bit of political acumen because his father had been mayor three decades prior to that. So he still had a little bit of that political blood in him. But he knew that there were things that needed to change. And Ron's platform was economic development. So what else is new? But Ron decided that there were some different ways to do some things. And when he took office in the late 1980s, he decided that the best thing to do early was to start trying to find a project we could hang our hats on. It just so happened that United Airlines was looking at building a new maintenance hub somewhere in the U.S. And so Ron gathered the forces of the local community, the chamber, private businesses, the city, and they decided to go after that United Airlines hub. And the way they did it was to bring the entire county together and say, okay, we're going to pass a one cent sales tax that will be on the, on the books for a specific period of time. We will build the building for United and give it to them. They're going to move people in here so the new jobs will create economic opportunity. The supplies they will buy, all of the things associated with that will be a, a great economic boost. The best thing that ever happened to Oklahoma City was we didn't get United. It was the best thing that ever happened for two reasons. Number one, it taught us a strong lesson that we were in fact on the right track, we just had the wrong target. But number two, Indianapolis got that, that project. Ron Norick and a couple of our leaders decided that we needed to see why Indianapolis had been successful and we had failed. We had a much better financial package. We had a lot of things to offer. So Ron and some of our civic leaders went to Indianapolis to look around, and what they saw was this. Indianapolis had a vibrant downtown. There were people on the streets. There were restaurants. There was entertainment. There were hotels. There were businesses. There were things to do in downtown Indianapolis, and there wasn't anything to do in downtown Oklahoma City. The second thing about that trip, though, and the second reason we were such great winners is that after that United Hub opened in Indianapolis, it closed two years later. The sustainability of that project was not there. And by pure dumb luck, and we've had a lot of pure dumb luck, and I'll tell you right now, building a city and making it work is a lot of pure dumb luck, and I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But the pure dumb luck was we didn't get that, so we didn't have that albatross around our neck. But we had come up with an idea that we found out would work. And so Ron and the civic leaders of Oklahoma City said, you know, we've got a downtown that has opportunities. Our downtown area is, is a quadrant. You all are familiar with Interstate 40. Well, it runs through Oklahoma City. And the elevated portion of I-40 in Oklahoma City bisects the downtown district so that the North Park Business District, the South Park Industrial District, North-south, we have a railroad track. Actually, we have six tracks, elevated, and it's a huge impediment east-west in our city. The northwest corner of that, of that quadrant is our business district. The northeast quadrant 
is an area that had been dubbed Bricktown. It was an old semi-industrial area, manufacturing, uh, light manufacturing, warehousing, that had fallen in great disrepute, and it was actually where Oklahoma City started. But it was full of empty warehouses. It was where the homeless folks pretty much congregated and lived. It was where there was some promise, but no delivery. We had had a couple of failed attempts of people coming in wanting to up, update Bricktown. We had seen what had happened in places like West End in Dallas and some other cities where some of these older industrial areas that were no longer fit for industrial had been turned into entertainment opportunities. Again, it was undercapitalized. And there was no impetus to make something happen. So Mayor Norick and a group of our citizens said, what if we did this? Our citizens were willing to vote a tax on themselves for a period of time to raise that money and give it to United Airlines. Why wouldn't they do that for themselves? Why wouldn't we decide that we're going to do that and pick ourselves up by our own bootstraps? So they went through a process that was kind of smoke and mirrors and said, okay, we're gonna come up with a group of projects and we're gonna put it on the ballot and we're gonna hold a referendum. And this was in the late 1980s. And what that referendum is going to be is an all or nothing referendum. You don't get to vote project by project. So they came up with, with these ideas. We had a baseball stadium at our state fair park. It was falling down and we didn't have the money to rebuild it. We've gotta build a new baseball stadium or we're gonna lose minor league baseball. And instead of putting it out at State Fair Park on the perimeter, why don't we put it in downtown? It's where we want people to come to. It's where we want to redevelop life. Why don't we put it in downtown? And you know what? If we ever want to do anything with Bricktown, we've got to have a steady stream of visitors coming into Bricktown. Let's put it there. You're crazy. There's nobody there. Why would people come? Well, we're going to force them to. We're going to, we're going to make it happen. The will of the city. We're going, to, we're going to do something to make progress happen. We had a gentleman by the name of Ray Ackerman. Ray is, is one of our great civic leaders. And Ray kept harping on water. You, know, you guys have got a beautiful natural river right here. We had a drainage ditch. The North Canadian River was, a, was literally the storm sewer for downtown Oklahoma City. It wound around the south side of town, and this is not a joke. When I first heard it, I thought, you're crazy. It's true. We had to mow it three times a year. There was no water in the North Canadian River. It was a drainage ditch that when the rains do come in Oklahoma, we get a lot of them, we get them fast, and they got to run off somewhere. North Canadian River. But the problem was brush, grass, heavy vegetation would grow in that when it wasn't raining, you know, or the rain would cause it to grow, but then when it did rain, all the tributaries emptied into that, and all the tree branches, all of the other junk that would flow down the river would clog it up, dam it up, and it would flood South Oklahoma City. Ray kept beating into their heads, you gotta do something with the river, we gotta have water, we gotta have water, it, it's, a, it's, the, 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 it's life, you know, it's, it's such a drawing card. So to shut him up, we did two things. One, we, dammed up, we agreed to dam up the river, put water in it, and put some trails along it. That'll be nice, it'll be peaceful, and you can, you know, you'll go away, Ray. Then he wanted to put a canal a la San Antonio in Bricktown. Now, this is the area of town where all the homeless people live and all the old warehouses are, and he wants to put a canal over here. But if we're gonna put the baseball stadium there, well, we may as well, why not, let's, let's humor the guy. We bow to Ray Ackerman every night in appreciation for his vision and his uh, dedication and firmness in beating home that point. Those were three of the projects, the baseball stadium, the river, the canal. We had an old arena. It was decent, it was still serviceable, but you know, wouldn't it be great if we could build an arena and maybe one day we could have some type of a sports team? May, yeah, the NHL is moving south. It'd be great to have hockey, and we've got a lot of Canadian expats that live in Oklahoma City. Wouldn't that be great? 
you know, and don't even mention the NBA because, you know, they, there's no way that Oklahoma City could ever be an NBA, t NBA location. But because of I-40 and I-35, there's a lot of concerts that come through on the 40 route, east to west or west to east. They need to have some good concerts. Let's throw that in. Our convention center is old and moldy and really looks bad. Let's update it. Let's throw that one in. We wound up with eight projects, and the proposal was this. We're going to implement a one-cent dedicated sales tax. I know you all have done that here on a couple of projects. A one-cent dedicated sales tax for, three year, for five years will raise about 300 to $325 million, and we will build all of these projects. But it's an all-or-nothing vote. You don't get to pick which project you want to vote on. You vote on all of them or none of them. Oklahoma City had not passed a tax referendum in decades. And by a vote of 52 to 48 percent, it passed. Flash, fast forward now to today. What that project has done, and it's very important to understand the dynamics of getting there, but what that project has done for us, all of those projects have come to fruition. Because we had an arena which happened to be the last project finished when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, the New Orleans Hornets needed a new home for a couple of years. And it just so happened we had an NBA quality arena that didn't have a tenant. Pure dumb luck. Took four weeks to negotiate the contract to move the Hornets from New Orleans to Oklahoma City for one year. They wound up staying two. We're now the home to one of the most successful teams in the NBA from a financial standpoint because we proved to the NBA we were worthy. What's that have to do with building you know, a vibrant city? Well, those projects, that river that we built, is now an Olympic training center. This past weekend, we had 1,500 athletes from across the country in Oklahoma City for the Oklahoma City Regatta. We had 50 colleges and universities, including Princeton, Yale, Harvard, Washington, Stanford, Cal, Texas, some of the premier rowing schools in the country. We are now an Olympic training venue for rowing, canoe, and kayak because Ray Ackerman wouldn't get off of his high horse and let us get away without doing the river. Thank you, Ray. Pure dumb luck. The pure dumb luck of that was not that we did the river, but that there happened to be a 2,500 meter straight stretch in that river that the Corps of Engineers had put in in the early 1900s. We filled it with water and we're now an Olympic center. The pure dumb luck is that we have continued to find projects like that and we have found through the way this was done, civic involvement and civic pride. We also have done something that is, is a little bit unique in, in our city from what I understand from a lot of other cities. It's the trust in local government. We call that project MAPS, Metropolitan Area Projects. The first MAPS, 300 to 350 million dollars, nine projects, they all came in on time, on budget. You pay cash as you go, you don't bond. Instead of city council being in charge of that program, we appointed a citizens oversight committee. And it's not, it's not people that most of us know. It's not the typical corporate or civic leaders. It's Joe Sixpack. It's people from every ward of the city, most of whom have never had any political affiliation or any political uh, opportunities or political desires. But they're there every day making sure that the city is spending the money the way they said they were going to and the way that it was intended to be spent. We've passed three more versions of MAPS. We just this past December passed the latest one, a seven-year, nine-month program that will raise $800 million to do nine new projects. And we passed it 56 to 44 with paid, organized opposition from the police and fire unions. And we still passed it in the worst economic times any of us have seen in years because of the trust in city government. Now what's that have to do with, with Bricktown? I said earlier, Bricktown itself was where 
the homeless folks lived and where we had a lot of warehouses that were empty. When we started the actual rebuilding of Bricktown, putting that baseball stadium in there, we had a spaghetti warehouse, a Pat O'Brien's, and one other bar. Spaghetti Warehouse is still there. The others went out of business. A couple of our local entrepreneurs had decided they wanted to try to build Bricktown on their own. They were undercapitalized and there was no commitment from the city until MAPS. And when the city put the baseball stadium down there, it started bringing life back to the city. When they put the canal in, it caused people to think maybe we could. The baseball stadium was the first project finished under MAPS. And literally when you talk to people in Oklahoma City today, they will tell you that overnight the mood in the city changed. The first thing that happened was the belief in city government and what it had said it was going to do actually came to fruition. Their credibility flipped overnight from eh to yes. Our mayor just got reelected, our, our current mayor just got reelected uh, by an 80-20 vote against opposition. That's the kind of credibility our government has because of what they've done with the MAPS program. This is what we said we're going to do, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to do it, and we've done it. And we've got a track record we'll stand on every day. But after putting that baseball stadium in and the city working with people to come in and organically grow that community, today Bricktown has over 80 restaurants, clubs, lounges, retail opportunities in Bricktown, and they're all thriving. They are all doing very well, and the majority of them are locally owned. They are not chains. They are local businesses that have invested in the downtown. We're seeing residential come back to downtown, not as fast as we want to, but it's certainly coming. We're seeing condos and apartments and lofts all around the area. We're not, we don't have them in Bricktown yet because of, of some particular situations, but we're working to make those things happen. That first MAPS program was 350 million, about 300 to and a quarter to 350 million in public investment. We hoped that we would get a two to one, maybe we could stretch it and get a three to one private match to that investment. In point of fact, we can document over three billion dollars, a nine to one return on investment from that original 325 to 350 million dollars. We can count another one billion dollars in other public investment. Right now we're moving Interstate 40. I-40 goes through Oklahoma City and it is an overhead crosstown expressway. It's collapsing. We gotta move it or rebuild it, we're moving it. We're moving it a half a mile south and putting it on grade. And as a result of that, we're able to open up 850 acres of previously industrial land to new development. It's just south of our current downtown. We have a 50-story headquarters office building being built in downtown Oklahoma City, self-financed by the company that's building it. This is a company that could have built anywhere in the United States. They're building in downtown Oklahoma City. And they are reinvesting in our community. When they announced the project, they asked the city for TIF funding. Y'all familiar with TIF funding? You get the incremental tax generated by the building, and most of the time, you fold it back into paying for the project itself. This particular company said, thank you for the money. Here's what you're going to do with it. They turned around and gave the city a little over a hundred million dollars back. And what they're doing with it is redoing every street in a 93 square block area of downtown Oklahoma City. From building front to building front, we're tearing the streets and the sidewalks up. We're relocating and redoing all of the utilities under those streets and putting down new sidewalks and streets to make downtown Oklahoma City more pedestrian friendly. Because this particular company said, we want to see more headquarters office buildings in downtown Oklahoma City and the way to do that is to make it attractive for people to be down here we want to be a part of doing that. 
That, folks, is the kind of trust that we have in our city government and the kind of commitment we have from civic leaders in Oklahoma City. We're not perfect, you know, we're, we're not utopia, but we have found a way to make things work by involving the civic, the corporate, and the public communities. We have tremendous cooperation between the city and our private businesses. Uh, our office is part of the Chamber of Commerce in Oklahoma City. I just came from our board retreat, uh, our annual board retreat, to come over here uh, to visit with you all for today. Uh, we had 150 civic leaders at our board retreat for two days talking about where we go next and what our legislative agenda is, what we want to do in the city, how we continue to move forward. We just voted on, on our fourth version of MAPS. We started talking about what's the fifth one going to be. It will be 10 years before we can hold another referendum on MAPS, but we're already talking about where do we go from here, and it's not idle talk. It's because we have, we have been able to develop that rapport, that trust, uh, that commitment from city government to the business community and vice versa. It's because leadership is not afraid to stand up and be accountable. And it's because our citizens are not afraid to hold our leadership accountable. It's because we've had open debates and honest disagreements about what needed to be done and how we did it. But we've made it work. We've figured out that it's not personal, it's business. And that by doing it that way, we are a better city for it. Skip alluded to one small problem that came up for us in the midst of it, and that was the bombing of the, of the Murrah building. That occurred in 1995. The first MAPS vote was passed in 1993. And as you can well imagine, when that bombing occurred, there were a lot of people in Oklahoma City that said, we need to slow down on MAPS. You know, we've just been hit with a really hard, hard shot. We need to slow down on this thing. We need to not be doing this. The citizens of Oklahoma City said, uh-uh. They're not going to get us. We're going to show ourselves more so than showing the world that we are stronger than this. We're going to show ourselves. We're going to prove to Oklahoma City that we can do. So they never, they never slowed down. They never stopped the MAPS program, and they never slowed down on it. And because of that, we're a stronger city today than we ever have been. We have built Oklahoma City and continue to build Oklahoma City literally one brick at a time by finding out what the needs are, what the desires are of the community, and how we can continue to move forward aggressively and progressively to make it a better place, not for us, but for our children and our grandchildren, because they're the ones that are going to benefit from this. It is a wonderful place to be. Uh, I'm, I'm an unabashedly proud Oklahoma City, and you know, it doesn't bother me one bit to stand up in front of you guys and talk about my city and tell you how proud I am of it. Every city can do this, though. You know, we're not unique. It's a matter of the, of, of the people of the city, whether it's Little Rock or Tulsa or Dallas or Fort Worth or Kansas City or whoever, deciding this is the course we're going to take and this is the way we're going to do it. We happen to have the good fortune in Oklahoma City to have had people that stood up and did that in the late 1980s and have continued that forward. The worst thing you can be in Oklahoma City is a candidate for public office who doesn't keep your word. We'll get you. Yeah. Our city council continually lives in fear that somebody is going to screw up maps and they don't want to be the person that does that. In addition to the original maps, the second maps was maps for schools, a seven-year project. We have rebuilt, built new, renovated, or expanded over 450 school buildings throughout Oklahoma County. Maps, the third version of Maps was an arena project where we needed to upgrade the arena that we built in Maps 1 to be able to accommodate the NBA. And the fourth version of Maps is what we have just passed, which is nine new projects, including a new convention center, a new downtown Central Park, uh, a, a streetcar trolley system that is going to be put in. Uh, along with uh, expansion to our river projects and several others. 
And again, with organized opposition, it passed 56 to 44 percent. It's a great place to live. If you've not been to Oklahoma City lately, I would invite you to come. You literally won't recognize it. You might not be able to get through the city right now because of all the construction going on, but you won't recognize the place. We're proud of it. We love it. We want to continue to see growth happen in our city. Uh, it's been a pleasure being here and visiting with some of the folks here in, o in, uh, in Oklahoma City, in Little Rock. See, Gretchen, it's so ingrained, it just kind of comes automatically, right? <laughs> Gretchen and, and Dennis and the folks from the CVB here that are good friends of mine and uh, we have good friendly competition with each other but we also help each other in a lot of ways to to be successful in the tourism industry but we're proud of our city we hope you will come visit us uh, come see what we're doing uh, take a look give us an opportunity to show you what this commitment uh, by our city government by our corporate leadership has done and what hopefully it can do for other cities in the country that are willing to stand up and take the steps. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here, Skip. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the hospitality. Uh, I know uh, we've got some question time, so I'll be happy to answer questions for a few minutes. And uh, thanks for having me here today. All right, we've got questions. And let's, let's, let's wait till we get the microphones here that are coming right at you, right behind you. Hello. I'm Kate Covey. I'm a student at the Clinton School. Thank you so much for taking time to come and visit with us and impart the lessons you've learned. Um, you talked a lot about um, physical building and infrastructure as a means to improve a city. And I'm curious about, especially with the revitalization of um, Bricktown, the type of social resources that were needed, especially for the, um, the displaced homeless population. We have a, a fairly significant network of social services groups. Um, obviously, Salvation Army, uh, Red Cross, uh, there are a number of the, the known entities. But we also have a lot of privately run and privately operated uh, social service entities, uh, the Jesus House uh, being one that immediately comes to mind. Most of those are congregated in one geographic area, fairly, fairly general area. But the city has worked very closely with those agencies to try to figure out how to better serve that population. Excuse me. How to coordinate those services and put them in not a confined area, but in a centralized area that is easily accessible via public transit and that is close to some of the other services that may be needed, such as health care. Um, the new projects that we're doing is requiring us to move some of those. Uh, Goodwill, for instance. The city has helped the Goodwill operation locate new facilities and help expedite their move. You know, the city can't do certain things, but they can certainly help in ways to make it easier for these agencies to move to a new location. So they have been very active in coordinating with them to make sure that that displacing them from their current location does not displace the services to the people that need them. Yeah, right here. Oh, let's wait for the, uh, oh, here, we just only got two. Go ahead and take this. Uh, Todd Larson, North Little Rock Economic Development. Uh, when we worked on our baseball stadium for financing, we studied maps, and it may be maps, too, that I'm thinking about where you had projects all over the county. In MAPS 1, was it solely focused on downtown, or did you have other projects to make it politically more palatable? I'm not used to standing behind a podium speaking, so that's why it's nice to be out here amongst you. Um, yes, MAPS 1 was strictly downtown. We have taken, we've kind of taken the philosophy that you cannot have a great city without a vibrant and great downtown core. You know, name me a city that has a dead downtown and is still a vibrant city anywhere in the world. It just, it doesn't happen. So our first MAPS program was, was in a pretty small, compact area because the need was so great there. MAPS 2 was all about schools, and it literally is countywide. Uh, we have 15 school districts in Oklahoma County. We have 500 school districts in the state of Oklahoma. So it's, it's not a good system. 
But Maps for Kids was not just about kids in city schools. It was in the schools all over the county to try to increase the, the quality of the workforce. So we felt like it needed to be for everybody. Maps 3 was the arena vote, again, back downtown. And Maps 4 that we just passed is predominantly downtown because there's still things we need to do down there, things that we want to do to continue to make it a more vibrant and more alive area. The one thing that we did do this time is begin to branch out around the community for two or three projects. We have a number of lakes in Oklahoma City, most of which have trails around them. Part of MAPS was money to connect all of those. So we're putting in 57 miles of new bicycle and running trails that will connect all of the lakes to each other, the breadth uh, of, of Oklahoma County, or of Oklahoma City. Again, 625 square miles. We also are going to put in four to five senior wellness centers around the city. You know, were they politically important to the vote? Maybe yes, maybe no, but it was a recognition that we have an aging uh, population base and that we need to begin spreading out to some degree at least, but still focusing on the core of the city. Question right over here. Well, he'll get the microphone to him. Hold on. Thank you. I've been to Bricktown, and uh, since Memphis is getting a Bass Pro Shop in the Pyramid, which, of course, is downtown, my question is, what kind of tax incentives did y'all have to lure companies like that to Bricktown? We do, um, we don't do tremendous tax incentives, quite frankly. Uh, we do some. Uh, the city has been very involved in doing infrastructure that is necessary to, to make it easy for business to come in. Uh, we also have a Bass Pro shop. Yeah, and the city was involved in Bass Pro, but again, it was, it was more the infrastructure that was needed to make that project viable to do. Uh, we did one not long ago, the, the Skirvin Hilton Hotel. Uh, the Skirvin opened in 1910, was premier hotel in Oklahoma City. It closed 19 years ago and literally was, a, was facing the wrecking ball. Uh, the city didn't want to see it go away, so they found a way to partner with a hotel company Excuse me. to renovate that facility. They have been very smart in how they have done uh, TIF funding and other incentives that make it possible to be an investment. Not a gift, but an investment. And so far, all of them have paid off extremely well. Yeah, I got a question right here. Hi, Jasmine Moore with MetroPlan. Um, you talked about the pedestrian infrastructure and some of the bike infrastructure and a little bit about an upcoming um, uh, rail line, streetcar. What about transit? How has that played into downtown and revitalization? Not very well. Um, again, with Oklahoma City was built for the automobile. I mean, that's just the the reality with with the the size the physical size of the city you know transit is a challenge for us and and we're dealing with that not very well right now but we're we are working on it part of maps four was a modern streetcar system with the intent that that is the beginning of a master plan for a community-wide transit program we have rubber tire transit but where does, you know, where, does it, where does it go and how can you afford it? Again, uh, I, I'm, I'm guilty, I'll admit it. Uh, my house is 25 minutes away from my office at 65 miles an hour. You know, I mean, that, that's the way we live in Oklahoma City. I'm a long way out, but I get there fast. You know, I don't have to slow down for a lot between my house and my office. We're all like that. And so transit is a challenge. We are working right now on a regional transit program with some of the uh, outlying cities, Edmond, Norman. Uh, it's, it's quicker for me to get from, from my office to OU's football stadium than to my house. You know, but they're three cities down from us. Well, how do, we, how do we do transit that brings people into Oklahoma City and back to Norman or up to Edmond and things? We're working on those issues. It's a long-term solution. It's not going to happen overnight, but we think that the modern streetcar system is a good starting place. Got 
Thanks a lot. Todd Moore, um, former Clinton student. <clears throat> um, first, let me just say that um, I'm, a, I'm a military brat that lived in Lawton, Oklahoma for six years, so I'm very familiar with Oklahoma City because that's where we went. To, we always used to go to shop. Um, what you've done there has been just magnificent. The downtown, me and my wife have vacationed in Oklahoma City, if you imagine that, and we have enjoyed our time there, and the downtown is, 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 is lovely. Um, my question is, you've touched a little bit on the trail and bike uh, system that you put in, you're putting in place, you're connecting those uh, trails. Will you talk a little bit about the economic impact of that? Because I think that sometimes we think of that as a, uh, a, a, a tool to um, placate our locals, but really it can be a draw for, for outsiders to come in. Also, will you talk about who your MVP candidate uh, for this year would be? Is, is it Kevin Durant or? <laughs> Kevin Durant, number two, uh, Russell Westbrook, number, or Kevin, number one, Russell, number two, uh, Jeff Green, number three, and I'm not sure if there's anybody else in the league, so, you know, we, uh, the, the question about trails, obviously one of the things we sell, and, and every city sells this, is quality of life. Along with, you know, part of the, part of the beauty of urban sprawl, I guess, is that we have a tremendous amount of green space in Oklahoma City. There are a lot of community parks, there's a lot of open space between our residential neighborhoods and downtown, some of our other developments. The opportunity to, to add to that trail system has provided us a tremendous uh, opportunity and selling point as we're going out recruiting companies. Um, call centers are not the highest and greatest economic opportunity that you get, but they ain't bad. Uh, we moved Triple A's primary call center from San Francisco to Oklahoma City 18 months ago. Let me tell you what a boost that has been for us and for those people. You can imagine coming from San Francisco to Oklahoma City. You know, if you make if you made seventy-five thousand dollars, you got a fifty percent raise right off the bat just by moving out of California. You know, Boeing is moving in. What they are seeing is that they can come to Oklahoma City or our area and you can buy a home. You can buy your own house instead of having to live in an apartment or living, you know, in, in uh, much tighter quarters. Uh, they also see the opportunity to be out in an environment where there are chances to get out and ride a bike, rollerblade, run. Uh, I live at the base of Hefner Dam. Um, my wife wanted to know if we had flood insurance because we walk out our front door and right there's the dam. I mean, literally right next to our house. But we walk out every morning and there are people riding bikes around the dam. It's 14 miles. You know, we have a great opportunity to improve the quality of health for people because of that trail system. And what we're doing now is making it possible for them to go from one in one corner of the county to another on those trails. So that's the kind of thing that has helped us in terms of being able to sell our city as a good opportunity for young people. You know, people that are more health conscious, you know, than, than perhaps some of us older folks are. You know, or, or maybe that we need to be more health conscious than we really are, and here's the opportunity to do something inexpensively, you know, to promote our own health. 